Hi, my name is Dr Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and I run a business that enables me to bring knowledge and learning to everyone, not just those who are at schools, colleges and university. And I do this by producing a range of blogs, vlogs and free online courses. But I do also run some slightly more in-depth courses, both online and face-to-face. -face. You don't need any previous qualifications to learn with me and there are several available. So once you've finished watching this video, head on over to my website to see if you you can learn online in your own time and for the month of November 2020 they're all half price so head on over to my website after this to see if you can make it to an event or learn online. This particular video is a psychological analysis of Dale Devon Shinetti. He murdered two women in the 1990s and raped several more. There are two other cases that I know of that have also been known as the bathtub killers. The first is a case from 1910 and the second is two daughters who kill their mother, Linda Anderson. The case I'm going to be discussing today is the murders of Christine Vu and Wendy Prescott and the rape and sexual assault of others between 1996 and 1999. I usually begin by talking about the background of the offender, however this isn't always possible. In my video that I did on escalation and de-escalation last week, I talked about how violent serial offenders can show patterns of escalation in their use of violent crimes. This can be an escalation in either the frequency or the intensity of the violence that's used, or sometimes both. What's much less talked about is when offenders appear to de-escalate their violent behaviour. This initially appears to be the case with this particular offender. I'll give you some details about the crimes themselves as this is one of those that aren't as high profile or had as much media attention as other crimes. On the 17th of September 1996, Christine Vu, who was aged 26, was found lying face down in a bath half filled in, a, in Arlington in Texas. Her hands, ankles and neck were wrapped with duct tape. An autopsy showed that she'd been raped, strangled and then drowned. A fingerprint was found in her apartment and DNA samples were collected during the autopsy, but this evidence didn't lead to any suspects at the time. On the 24th of December 1996, 20-year-old Wendy Prescott, who lived in the same apartment complex, was also found lying face down in her bathtub. Her neck, wrists and ankles had been wrapped in duct tape and were all connected together with a band of duct tape down her back. An autopsy showed that she'd been sexually assaulted and bound in this fashion and her cause of death was manual strangulation. Investigators recovered a high quality fingerprint from the television stand in Wendy Prescott's apartment and sperm samples were also recovered. But again, no matches were returned from the law enforcement databases at the time. It's fairly unlikely for the victim and the offenders to know each other when someone commits more than one murder. Some single murderers don't know their victim either, but that is more rare. The victims of serial killers are, more often than not, strangers. The victims of serial killers are more often than not females as well. The average age of the victim is 33 years old. And prime targets for serial killers are hitchhikers, women living alone, prostitutes, young children and the elderly. A serial murderer might have several motives for committing their crimes. And this motive can even evolve during the series of crimes. However, serial killers mainly kill because they want to. In cases where the victim and the offender don't know each other, the victim will still hold some meaning to the offender. And that meaning will be revealed by the way that the offender treats the victim. A study by Professor David Cantor revealed how the victim can be treated as an object as a vehicle or as a person. In these sets of killings, what we see is that the offender used tape as a binding. And that means that it's likely that these victims were being seen as a vehicle to the offender. When the victim is treated as a vehicle, the offender is using the victim to express their anger or their desires in some way. 
The victim herself is of no real significance, however, they are symbolic to the offender. In murders where the victim is vehicle, there are usually frenzied attacks and the offender behaves in emotional ways and they might beat or bludgeon the victims. The offender would often use gags, bindings or other types of props on the victim. The offender sees the victim's suffering and pain as a fundamental part of the offence. In these two murders, the offender rapes and strangles the women. The bindings were put on fairly neatly, which means that it's likely that the victim was forced to comply with these bindings being put on them. Therefore, it is likely that the offender had a weapon to threaten the victim with. Fingerprints were covered from both houses. And this means that the offender has little forensic awareness or little concern that the fingerprints could be used to identify him. He knew his fingerprints weren't stored on any police databases and it's unlikely that he will have been involved with the police before those instances. He raped and sexually assaulted these women before strangling them. From a psychological point of view, this shows that their suffering and trauma was a fundamental part of the offence. Once he was finished with the victims, he was no longer interested in, in them and that could be why he posed them face down in the bathtub. But it could also have been some misguided attempt at getting rid of any semen evidence in the water. Both of these women lived in the same apartment block. Offenders tend to offend in areas that they know well. People who lived in the apartment block were rightly very worried that it might happen to them. Many of them moved, which made tracing suspects even more difficult. I couldn't find any information about this man's upbringing or previous relationships in any internet searches that I did. I was looking for any disruption during childhood, any feelings of abandonment or any attachment issues, but I wasn't able to find anything. The only information that I could find on Shinetti was that his family were described as supportive during the trial and his sister made several appeals in his judgment. There's no evidence from school that he was disruptive or struggled in any way. The next thing I was looking for was some kind of nucleus event. A person doesn't just wake up one morning and decide to kill there's usually some preceding event which is usually traumatic such as the death of a loved one, the end of a relationship, being cheated on and many more situations of that kind. Again though I couldn't find any information relating to that. Shinetti had lived at the apartment complex where both women lived and died. The only other link between the victims turned out to be that they both visited a nightclub where Shinetti had worked on the doors. He was responsible for checking the identification documents of those who were entering. He's most likely to have remembered or written down their addresses and targeted these women. This just screams at me that there are more women out there who haven't been identified as being his victims yet. It was never established throughout the trial what had triggered him to kill. However, it would be very unusual for Wendy Prescott to be his first victim. We know that she wasn't his last. He went on to carry out several more rapes and sexual assaults on four other women and the murder of another. I'll briefly go over the details of each one. The first attack was the sexual assault and murder of Christine Vu in September 1996. The second assault and murder was Wendy Prescott in December 1996. Then there were no more recorded attacks until September of 1998 in a second area. The lapse in time may have been because he wasn't working at the nightclub or didn't have access to information on his victims or that he'd moved and hadn't worked out how to target his next victims yet. The third attack was in September 1998 when another woman was raped at her home. 
The fourth was in October 98, when a female police officer who lived yards away from the previous woman, from where the previous woman lived, said that she was in uniform at a gas station in 95 or 96 when Shinetti befriended her and said that he lived in a nearby Lancaster apartment complex. She testified that the two spoke several times by phone over the next six months, but that they never dated. During the conversations, he said that he was a jack of all trades. She told the jury her attacker used her handcuffs to restrain her after he'd assaulted her. She asked him how he got into her apartment and she said he said that he was a jack of all trades. When I heard that, I thought it was him, meaning Shinetti. The fifth attack was in December 98, when a woman was sexually assaulted at the Lancaster apartment complex. She testified that she fought back which enraged her attacker enough that he kicked down her bedroom door. Her two-year-old son pleaded with the man, let my mum go, as he slapped the man's legs. The sixth attack was in February in 99, when a college student was attacked after going to bed for the night. The seventh incident was in October 99, and this woman told jurors how she could hear breathing in her apartment and it woke her up. She testified that a man raped her at gunpoint. She was pregnant and said that she prayed for God not to forsake her. As the attacker was leaving, she asked him why he raped her. He said, I don't know. I'm mad at the world. And this just hints towards what I said earlier about there being some traumatic event or deeply upsetting event being the turning point. From the evidence that was presented in court, it sounds as though Shinetti was already in the apartment of some, or maybe even all, of the women's apartments before they returned home. There's no sign of a break-in at any of the apartments, and at least two of them said that they'd gone to bed before being attacked. This infers that he'd spent time following them, making sure that he knew where they would be and when they'd be alone. He knew what time they'd come out and, and what time they were likely to be home. One of the women told the court that he'd made it clear that he'd been stalking her. The most likely trajectory for violent serial murders is to begin by either looking at pornography or peeping through windows from a fairly young age. And this is because they need to overcome a series of social restraints. Overcoming these restraints begins with taking away a person's right to privacy by watching them. The next social restraint to overcome would be crossing the boundaries of somebody's property. It could be stealing from sheds or garages or even committing burglary. The next constraint to overcome would be some kind of physical interaction or assault. In some cases, this leads on to the ultimate show of power and control and taking another person's life. So this is why I said that it would be highly unusual for a sexual murder to be the offender's first crime. We've seen these patterns of progression over and over with different offenders. I suspect that there have been people who've been peeped on by this offender. I also believe that there are likely to be unsolved burglaries that Shinetti has been involved in before the murders. Similarly, I suspect there are rapes before 1996 that he's also responsible for. And I say this because it's incredibly important for the offender to make sure that he can get away with it when he does offend, and in this case, kill the victims. It's unusual for offenders to show patterns of de-escalation in the amount of force that they use. However, it's not impossible. For example, Dennis Rader, who I talked about the other week, murdered 10 people between 1974 and 1991. However, he didn't carry out any more murders until he was arrested in 2005. He told investigators that he'd engaged in autoerotic activities as a substitute for the killing. He set up a tripod in camera and photographed himself in various forms of bondage. Some of this bondage involved Raider limiting his own oxygen supply to experience a heightened feeling of euphoria during sexual release. I'll put the link to both of the videos in the description box below. Dale Shinetti was finally arrested in May 99 for criminal mischief. 
He was arrested for burglary of a car audio shop in DeSoto, just south of Dallas. He was convicted and sentenced to 12 months in jail. This crucially meant that his fingerprints and his DNA were then stored on central police databases for the first time. In 2000, the Arlington police resubmitted the fingerprint and sperm samples to the FBI, who found a conclusive match with Shinetti. He was convicted of all crimes and he was sentenced to the death penalty. He'd made several failed appeals about his sentencing and his last words before being put to death were, my only statement is that no cases ever tried have been error free. Those are my words, no tr cases have been ever free. Not sorry, not please forgive me, not I love my family, just no cases tried have been error free. I think that just about sums up how he feels about the assault, rape and deaths of these victims. He's saying this isn't fair. He's pointing the finger at others for making mistakes without acknowledging his own wrongdoing. He doesn't value any other life besides his own. I could go over the papers and the reasons for him making the appeals, but they are very exciting. They all relate to things that he believes that the judge, the prosecution or the defence should have done or did incorrectly. You can read them in the links below if you like. For more of an insight into his personality, have a read of the extract below in the video description, which is written in Shinetti's own words. It's an advert for pen pals from a prison page that has since been taken down. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope that you have found it interesting and more importantly, I hope that you've learned something from it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.